Hey guys, welcome back to your Loft Home Groups. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed this journey through Romans thus far. We've covered quite a bit of chapter one. We're actually going to jump over into chapter three this week, and we'll kind of do that uh, here and throughout because we don't have the space to navigate the entirety of the letter this summer. Um, so we encourage you to read some of the stuff that we miss, um, ask questions about it, come by the office, pick our brains, uh, whatever you want to do. But we want to be able to see the highlights so we can navigate some of the major points that Paul is trying to communicate in this letter to the church at Rome. I'm going to pray for us, and then we will dive in. Father, we thank you for tonight. God, we know we finished last week a little bit heavy, and, and tonight we're going to um, kind of let that weight sit for a little in some tension and let us think about that um, before we can begin to prepare ourselves for the good news, that sometimes in the church we want to rush um, to the bad news, or to the good news out of the bad news, Lord. Uh, but we actually, I think, need to sit there for just a little bit um, in order to have a better understanding of you and your love for us. So, Father, tonight we pray that Scripture would convict us, uh, that we would see it rightly, and we love you and we trust you. And just remember, pray. Amen. In chapter 3 tonight, we're going to go through, and you can actually pick up in verse 9, uh, but just as a reminder from where we've been, remember this is a letter from Paul to the church at Rome. He hasn't been there. He's trying to get there, hoping that um, in the success for the church of Rome, uh, that he'll actually be able to move through even onto his, uh, even into his way to Spain, and so that the gospel would just begin to expand in the known world. Uh, one of the things going on in the Church of Rome, which really is at the tension of a lot of this letter, is that you have Jewish Christians who are historically Jewish, and so um, they have a lot of the Old Testament uh, and things of that sort, and they have a lot of the old practices like circumcision, and then you have Gentile Christians who are not Jewish Christians and do not historically have any of that. And so they're just now hearing about Jesus and trying to follow Jesus and this God of everything. Um, and they're trying to make that work within a church body, um, uh, just racially, by socioeconomic status, by dynamics, just a lot of split apartness and division. And Paul is trying to move them towards unity, and he believes that the center of all that unity is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. But in order for them to understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus, they're going to have to understand what the bad news is, that what's happening is the Jewish people and even the Gentile people are building up their own mountains of morality and looking down on one another, thinking that they are better than each other. And so Paul is beginning to lay, level the playing field um, by all of their sin so that way they can understand their desperate need for Jesus and the solution that Jesus brings in the midst of that. And in the midst of bad news, I... I remember being a senior in high school, um, and a couple years before, I had a teammate who ran with us, and um, we were kind of always competing at about the same speed and pace and things like that, and he graduated a year before me and went on to go run for a junior college up in Kansas. And I uh, worked at my church at the time. I was facility staff, and so I'm cleaning our worship center, and I get a call from a teammate, and he goes, hey, did you hear um, that Tyler passed away in a car accident? Now, we're about a week from Thanksgiving, um, so he was supposed to come home and be with his family and things like that, and I was like, this cannot be true. Well, quickly, word spread all throughout the high school and all throughout town um, that Tyler had died in, in this car accident. And what happens when you're a high school student and when you lose somebody who is either maybe fresh out of high school or still in high school who's really highly liked, um, pretty popular, and a lot of people know him, is uh, it really actually starts to draw all of you together um, and bring you a new group, and, and you start having conversations as a high school student that, that maybe you've never had before, and so um, we're all trying to figure out how do you wrestle with death, because maybe like a grandparent has passed, or somebody that was really, really sick, but never like a healthy person your age so suddenly, and in such a tragic way, and so we're having all these conversations, and what happens is there's this girl who I went to school with who really loved Jesus, and in the midst of what is actually a group message of a whole bunch of us within the track team, she finds the courage to ask the question, hey, does anybody know what Tyler's relationship with God was like? And I remember seeing those words kind of flash across my screen, and I was like, oh my gosh. Something that I had been thinking about, but not something that I wanted to ask, because the reality was, as I had been on Tyler's team for years, I was supposed to be the church kid, I prayed before our races, um, and in the midst of that, for me, I knew what I believed to be the answer, and that's that Tyler, though a good kid, did not believe in Jesus. Or at least he didn't have an act of faith. He wasn't going to church. He wasn't doing anything. He, he wasn't expressing any fruit that Scripture would tell us comes um, from a believer 
And, and instead of me answering that question, because it's not in the midst of mourning, kind of the, the sense that you want to bring to the table, one of our friends types across and says, oh, Tyler and God were good. And I remember seeing that and kind of pausing and thinking that it was a feel-good thing in the moment, um, and it's this tension that sometimes we don't like to uh, talk about eternity in the midst um, of death and things like that because we maybe don't want to answer hard questions, especially as believers. But I remember seeing that, and I kind of paused and thought and realized that for most of my life and most of our lives, we see our relationship with God as, oh, we're good. Like, we have a mutual respect. Like, we're going to run into each other in a building, and, you know, guys, maybe you're going to give them, like, a bro hug, or uh, this is like, oh, hey, how you doing? How's your family type of deal? But not, like, intimate relationship, right? Like, I don't really, if people ask me how me and my wife are, how me and my closest friends are, I don't go, oh, well, we're good. And I remember seeing that and going, that's how most people think about their relationship with God. That's how they see it. That's how they envision it. Even after last week, as we walked through this list of sin that Paul lays out in chapter one, even if we found ourselves in the midst of that, even if we're super aware of what our own sin is, we quickly try to make this hop, skip, and a jump towards, well, yeah, but, but God, God loves me, and so we're good. But what's interesting is scripture does tell us that God loves us and loves us uh, no matter our sin, and he wants us and he wants his people, but he doesn't say that we are good with him just because of his love. There's still a separation. There's still a gap. Like God still loves all the people he's kind of wrestling with within the Old Testament. And so there's some things that, that happen within who Jesus is that we're going to talk about next week that kind of bring that relationship together. That yes, love is initiated by God. Salvation is given by God. But a regular rebellious people do not get to stand rightly with God. And in the midst of that, Paul begins to lay that out in chapter 3, and he's leading them into a point that we're going to talk about next week as he continues to kind of lay on the bad news uh, before we get to the good. And, and here's what he says, that just in case, after we looked at all that list, maybe we even got to it and said, I don't struggle with any of those, I don't approve anyone who does, Paul makes it very, very clear, because what's happening is the Jewish people are going, we followed all of these laws that you gave us, so we are righteous based off of those laws. And then the Gentile people are saying, well, well, we just, we live by faith, and so we do whatever I want, and, and Jesus saves us. And in the midst of that tension, Paul says, here, let me clarify some things for you. In verse 9, he says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, and buckle up, because this is a bumpy ride, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now remember, in chapter 2, we, we didn't read chapter 2 last week, but we talked about it. Uh, Paul says, even if you don't have the traditional Jewish law and the things given by God, you are still accountable to the own law that you are writing within yourself and your own conscience, and even you break that. But to the Jewish people who have had law revealed to them, the things of God revealed to them, what it looks like to follow God and to know God and to be in relationship with God, he says, the, the, in the midst of that, that law brings knowledge of sin. Now, it didn't mean that sin didn't exist. It just meant as people were trying to figure out what it looked like, what the holiness of God looked like, and what holiness should look like in their life, God revealed to them the law that said this is what holiness and righteousness and the goodness of God looks like. And then we quickly figured out, man, we don't measure up. So it says, hey, that law has revealed just how far from God you really are. And then he paints this picture in verses 11 through 18 that just feels just violent and dark. And it's really to sit there and say, this is how you need to understand the depths of your sin. Because for you and I, we like to look at our sin as rose-colored glasses. Like, hey, sure, I do this thing, but me and God are good. Sure, I, I gossip about girls and, and ruin the reputation of them within my school, but me and God are good. Because I go to church. 
Yeah, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm in dating relationship from dating relationship from dating relationship. I have uh, what feels like just a trail of skeletons in my closet in the midst of that, but, but me and God are good. Because I went to youth camp one time. But yeah, I, I, I talk bad about people in the locker room, and I gossip, and I just swear like crazy. I'm always angry. I talk bad about my parents. But me and God are good. Because it's not as bad as that kid. Because I don't drink. I don't have sex. And Paul begins to frame and he says, just in case we went through that list of sins last week and you found yourself somehow still innocent, let me start with this. No one is righteous, not one. That the goal of walking with Jesus is to be holy and to find out what holiness looks like and, and to walk in holiness and to become more and more holy every day. And so just in case there was any moral mountain left, Paul obliterates it and says, no one is righteous. Come down to our level. See your need for Jesus. So that way you can better understand him. Because here's the deal. When I sit down and we, we'll talk and maybe we'll hear your testimony and we'll say, well, why? Tell me about when you gave your life to Jesus or tell me about you know, why you're a Christian or why do you need Jesus. A lot of times these are the, the sentences, the statements that are made. Well, I just, I just want to be closer with him. Or I just, he, he helps me feel like I'm not alone. Or I just, I just want to go to heaven one day. And what happens is somewhere along the way, we lost track that in the gospel, the good news is good news because the bad news is so heavy. We lost track along the way that as parents were patting us on the shoulder and saying, you're the good kids. Oh, that's the good group. That's what I want my kids to hang out with that we lost track that no matter whatever moral goodness that we have, without, no matter what good decisions that we make, that apart from Jesus, there's no one righteous. No matter how many rules you follow, no matter how good your attendance is, no matter if your family says that they're Christians, no matter what church you go to, there's no one that is righteous apart from Jesus. Now we're going to get at the end of chapter 3 next week and, and begin to see, hey, this is what the righteousness of God looks like and how we can obtain it and what it means for us. And we're going to talk the rest of the summer about what it looks like and how it plays out. But for now, we just need to sit in the fact and understand and look at our own sin and go, I mean, where do we even just see our own unrighteousness at play? For me, I, I can see it all the time, man, and some of my, my anger at home and some of the things that I'm not always the best dad, I'm not always the best husband, I'm not always the best pastor. That there are many parts of me that feel very distant from God. And they remind me of my desperate need for Jesus. For you, have you sat in the seats in the loft? Have you sat in your bedroom during quarantine? Are you sitting in the house that you're in right now and you're reminded of your desperate need for Jesus because of the depths of your own sin? That no one is righteous, not even one. That our sin leaves our throats like open graves our mouth full of curses and bitterness, our feet swift to shed blood, to ruin the people around us, to break everything around us for the sake of our own gain. The more often than not, that's really what sin is. To obliterate the path in front of us for the sake of our own gain, to make ourselves God. Talk about that tonight and what does that play out and what does that look like and and what do we believe that, that Jesus is going to have to say about that as we look into that? What does that do for how we view people and how we see people that we're finally on a level playing field so that way we can let the gospel bring us into unity instead of separating us apart? That come this fall when we're back in the loft for the first time worshiping together, that it's a beautiful movement of people on level playing ground pursuing the righteousness of Jesus because we understand the depths of our own sin. Father, tonight, we thank you that whatever morality we hold so tightly to, that the gospel unclenches our fists and lets us cling to Jesus. Father, we pray that you convict us every day of sin, that we might look more and more like you. We love you and we trust you in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. <laughs>